Graniteville, South Carolina, 2005. This sleepy town is located between the city of Aiken and Augusta and was the subject of a major chemical disaster. Many of those that cover the subject mainly focus on the train wreck itself. Here's where he crashed. The target's wrong. But not everyone focuses on the aftermath. Tonight, we will look into exactly what the residents went through as their neighborhoods flooded with chlorine and how they survived. On January 5th, 2005, local train P-22 began its daily operation. The regularly assigned conductor and engineer were both off duty that day, and their jobs were filled from a list of available substitutes. At the end of their scheduled run, train P-22's crew parked the train on the side near Avondale Mills plant. The train crew contacted the local train dispatcher before leaving to let them know P-22 was using those set of tracks. Although the railroad switch for Avondale Mills siding was meant to be set before P-22's crew left, the train's brakeman later told the NTSB that he was not 100% sure he had aligned the switch for mainline operation and that he might have made a mistake. At 2.38 a.m. on January 6, 2005, a freight train 192 approached Graniteville. The train tried to use its emergency brake when the engineer saw the improperly aligned switch, but it was too late. At 2.39 a.m., train 192 collided with P-22. The collision derailed both lead engines 16 of 192's 42 freight cars and one of P-22's freight cars. Train 192 was carrying chlorine gas. One of 192's tank cars ruptured releasing about 60 of the 90 tons of gas it was carrying. 250 people were exposed to the gas and 5,400 residents within one mile of the crash site had to evacuate. The emergency response teams were conflicted on how to proceed. This left them useless to the inhabitants immediately inside the crash zone. The chlorine wasn't even identified as the substance spreading throughout the residents for almost an hour. When 911 was called, the dispatchers knew little else to tell the residents other than, get out of the area, we've got people on the way. Here are some testimonies from those that were inside the crash zone. Gary Spires, an excerpt from the New York Times. Gary Spires Sr., 60, was at a machine that dyes fabric when he and other workers noticed the chlorine Two co-workers next to him began vomiting. We were smelling it coming through the ducts in the building, Mr. Spires said in a telephone interview from his hospital bed in Aiken, South Carolina on Friday. It just kept intensifying. We didn't know what it was. We thought it was internal. But then we came to find out it was outside and that we were in immediate danger. Mr. Spires said that he ran past the two co-workers who were lying on the floor. I had to try and save my own life, he said. I was gasping for breath. I only had one thing in my mind, to save my life. I went up those stairs to the parking lot two and three steps at a time. When I got to my truck, I drove straight out of the parking lot. It looked like a stream of snow. I couldn't even see the road. Mr. Spires said that he drove to a gas station. The air there was cleaner, but the smell was persistent. The lady at the gas station saw me. 
locked up the station and asked me to get in her car. She drove me to the hospital. Next, we will listen to the resident stories. This video comes from the state's YouTube channel. I heard a real loud boom. So I thought it was a bomb or something. And um, I rode down past Po Boys. And once I turned, go, went over the hill, I just got a, 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 a it was a smell like a swimming pool had per, burst. I called, I did dial 911 before we come out in the house. And they told me, look, get in your car. We can't send anyone in the Graniteville to get you. Get in the car and you drive and drive as hard as you can and don't stop until you get to the emergency room. They had emergency vehicles from everywhere. I mean, everywhere you looked, there were red and blue lights. And uh, they talked about the uh, decon process of where they were taking them to USC Aiken and having to hose them down, so to speak. There was a, a waiting room full of residents from Granville and people that I knew. And I, was, and I was asking them, they had been transported over there on a bus from Aiken. And I asked them, where was Joe, my brother? And they said, he's, in, he's upstairs in intensive care. And so I went up and um, I was able to see him and uh, see the doctor. And um, I was actually shown the x-rays and his entire lungs were white. That's all I could see. In the aftermath of the train wreck, the people of Graniteville lost the lives of loved ones, their homes, and their jobs. The chlorine damaged wiring in buildings, ruined anything electronic, killed trees, plants, and even the birds. For what seemed like years, Graniteville was a ghost town. There were no birds singing, the people silent as they suffered through the horrific event that played out in the center of their town. Evidence of the train wreck remained constant in their day-to-day -day lives. There are scars in the trees from train debris, shrubbery long dead from the chlorine gas, and a wooden cross that lies where the train engineer died. The citizens who lived immediately in the affected area were evacuated and taken to shelters and hotels. Some would be allowed to return to their homes in a few days, more in a few weeks, and the people living nearest the impact point a few months. Their homes had to be decontaminated and the damages repaired. Norfolk Southern paid the costs. Nothing we have said in this video can convey what this disaster has done to Graniteville. So we will leave you with the final words on the subject from those who are still living in Graniteville. An excerpt from AP News article. It destroyed that town, which is my hometown. It's just not Graniteville anymore, said a 46-year-old woman who said she lived in the town until she was a young adult. I still have family and friends there, but it doesn't seem like the town I was raised in. That train wreck, that matter of minutes that morning, destroyed it. It's not green, it's not lush, it's not like it used to be. It is dead. It is not the community I grew up in. Ten years later, we are able to say that Graniteville is moving forward. The Graniteville and surrounding communities that were impacted is moving forward and we're doing things to um, help to improve the community, improve the standard of living.